Kevin Mitnick has been part of the 2600 community for many years, and um, his story resulted in a documentary that Emmanuel put together and put a lot of work into called Freedom Downtime. Um, if you haven't seen that, I highly suggest you pick it up. I don't know if it's for sale out there, but uh, if not, it should be. But uh, let's get straight away to Kevin Mitnick. How's every well? Yeah, hello. How's everybody doing? Yeah. All right. Well, hello. Test this. Okay, perfect. I could walk around now. It's great to be back. I'm sorry. I was supposed to speak here two years ago, but I was in Bogota, Colombia. And either from the food or the water, I ended up getting really sick. Ended up in the hospital in Colombia. They couldn't figure out what virus I had or what I ate that put me in there for about eight days. But I remember I'm sitting there in the hospital. Of all, all of a sudden, like three days later, the phone rings. I pick it up. I figure it's my family, right? It's some guy from CNN. He goes, Kevin, what's going on? And how, first of all, how did you know I was in the hospital? B, how did you get my number? And he says, oh, no, no, we found out you're in the hospital. We want to know what's going on. So I just told him I'm sick. I have a flu. But then he started getting into more interesting questions. He goes, so why exactly are you in Bogota, Colombia? <laughs> I told him I couldn't tell him. But, um, yeah, so I'm sorry I didn't get to make it last, uh, last hope, but I'm here today, and I'm just going to go through uh, some stories that you might find entertaining. I'm going to show you guys how you could easily unmask caller ID. So when anybody calls you, like on your cell phone, there's a real quick and easy way you could do it. So basically, there's, you don't have privacy. You know, get, get over it. Right? Do, have any of you already do that? Do you already unmask your caller ID when people call you? Because the old way of doing that is you forward the incoming call to an 800 number and then forward it you know, through one of these services back. But there's a much easier way. And last week, I'm proud to announce I got to sign my uh, uh, book deal with Little Brown. It's a publisher in New York, and I'm going to be able to write my life story. I had to wait a long time. <laughs> Finally, I get to tell my side. I had to wait seven years because part of my plea agreement with the federal government was that I couldn't profit off my story for seven years, and that expired in 2007. And then it took a while for my co-author and I to write up a proposal, then it went around to these publishing houses and I finally got the deal. So I hope, maybe in the next conference, I hope this is not really the last hope, but if it is, but the next HackerCon, I'll be able to present that book all to you. So, some stories. Um, I don't know, how many of you were here when I spoke four years ago? Okay, wow, okay, about 30% to 50%. So I might go over some of the same stories, just sit back and relax, and hopefully the people that weren't here will be uh, entertained. When I first got into uh, computers, it really started when I was a young kid, when I was 11 years old, I was fascinated with magic. And I used to hang out at the magic store on the weekends to learn, you know, my, my mom used to go to work and I had to go to school. Then on the weekends, I'd go to the magic sh store and kind of sit there and try to watch the salespeople perform illusions, and then I, I tried to learn the secrets. And then from magic, I fell into this hobby called amateur radio. And I think you just heard that they're offering amateur radio tests. And when I started in amateur radio, this is where I got very interested in telephony because ham radio, they, they had things called auto patch back in the days where you can make phone calls, but you couldn't do it for personal, uh, personal use. So once I got into amateur radio, I met another student in high school in Los Angeles, California, and this kid was into phone freaking. And he wanted to borrow one of my ham radios, and in exchange, he said he will teach me a little bit about this unknown world of me of telephones. And this kid could do amazing things at the time that I thought was amazing. He can call a telephone number, a local number, put in a five-digit code, and call anywhere in the world. Little did I know, he was using Sprint and MCI at the time. If he had somebody's uh, telephone number, he can call a secret number at the phone company called the CNA Bureau, and he can get the name and telephone number. If he just had my parents' names, he was able to get my non, their non-published number. 
So this was all very interesting to me. So I became involved in this uh, area of phone freaking. And then because I'm a prankster, I took this area of uh, phone freaking and I applied it to pulling pranks on friends. So one of the first things I did was I accessed a telephone company switch in Pasadena, California. And I was friends with another guy that was also into the phone freaking. And I changed the class of service on his home telephone to that of a payphone. <laughs> so whenever he or his parents would try to make a call, it'd say, please deposit a quarter. <laughs> that was fun. But what was even more interesting is intercepting directory assistance. There was a special way of calling a toll-free number, and then with the A, B, and C, D tones, you could actually set up intercepts on directory assistance around the United States. And they really fixed this flaw after we had fun with them for about a weekend. Especially Providence, Rhode Island, people would call in, and we get to play directory assistance operator. And you could imagine, 17 and 18 years old, the fun you could have, right? So people would call in, I'd say, what city? They'd say, Providence, Rhode Island. I'd say, name, please. They'd give me the name. And I'd say, hold on, I'm looking that up for you, sir. And I'd say, oh, by the way, we're doing a survey. Do you mind spending about 15 to 20 seconds to complete our survey today? He goes, sure. And I'd say, okay, one of our first questions, are you at home or in the office? I'm at home. Do you have our current yellow pages and white pages at home? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> then why are you calling me? <laughs> Another call, someone, you know, what city? Providence, Rhode Island. May I have the uh, name, ma'am? Sure, it's John Smith. Okay, one moment, please. That number is 555-21-37. <laughs> what? 555-21-37. And they'd go, how do I dial a half? <laughs> and I said, you know, between the one and zeros, you're dialing the phone, you just kind of give it a little bit of a nudge, or <laughs> you can go down to our phone center stores, they existed at the time, and you can buy one of our new phones that has halves on it. <laughs> Unfortunately, that fun only lasted for the weekend, um, because we did a little bit more uh, uh, immature pranks, but I'm not going to go into that over here in this conference because I'm being recorded. And by the way, anything I talk about today, just my disclaimer, everything happened over five years ago, so it's past the federal statute of limitations. <laughs> All right, so just so we know. Okay, perfect. But when I was in the amateur radio, I also was a prankster, and my target was my favorite, uh, not my favorite, but my, the most well-known fast food restaurant in the industry, McDonald's. Have any, have you, any of you played with McDonald's with uh, radio in the audience? Can you, and you know what fun you could have, right? So when a customer drives up to the drive-in window and places an order, I, with my friends, parked across the street, could take over the system. So now the customer is not speaking to the guy inside with a headset, he's speaking to me. So you can imagine, right? Customer drives up, yes, may I take your order, please? Yada, 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 and say, well, congratulations, you're our 50th customer today. Drive forward, your order's for free. <laughs> and then I had a friend that did a really good Indian accent, right? So what happened is the customer would place the order and it kept getting repeated back incorrectly, right? For, you know, for about 10 or 15 times so the per person loses patience. And then of course there was menu changes at McDonald's where no longer were there hamburgers, french fries, and sodas. It was all burritos, tacos, and uh, hot dogs. So after messing with this one McDonald's, this was in Hollywood, California, this, uh, they put a sign on the drive-up window that it's closed because they kept getting uh, uh, messed with. So the manager of this McDonald's comes out right after we were playing with him for a while. He comes out and he's looking in the parking lot and he's looking for the culprit who's messing with you know, their system. And he's looking around and he has no idea. Again, we're sitting across the street of a big boulevard. It's like right over here on Broadway. And we're watching, we're laughing in the car. And so this guy starts looking around, he sees nothing. He goes up to the drive up speaker and he's examining it and he's looking at it like, you know, he's like it's possessed. And he's like looking around 
And then he doesn't see anything, so he puts his face right next to the speaker. <laughs> I couldn't resist. What the fuck are you looking at? And this guy <laughs> blew. <laughs> I never saw a guy run so fast except when. <laughs> it was great. I mean, we, we, had, we had a great time with McDonald's. So, um, yeah, those were, those were kind of interesting pranks. Um, back in uh, 1988, I don't know if you know my kind of my history, that was the first time I was like uh, federally busted for computer hacking. A friend of mine and I were hacking into a company called Digital Equipment Corporation. And what happened is we had a falling out, and he informed the FBI what I was doing, and they set up a sting operation. I was arrested. At the time, the federal prosecutors had told the judge that I had the capability of starting a nuclear war by whistling into a payphone. <laughs> At the time I was in court, when I went to court for my uh, detention hearing, as they call it, I, I was like expecting to get out because I just spent three days in Terminal Island Federal Prison, and it wasn't a fun experience. And I go to court, and I'm ready, you know, I'm, you know, I'm looking at, you know, when am I going to get out of here? And then when the federal prosecutor said that I, I could just whistle into a phone and start a nuclear war, I actually grinned, because I thought he would lose all credibility with the court. But what happened is the judge says, you're absolutely right, Mr. Prosecutor. In fact, we need to make sure that he can't even get to a telephone in the prison. So I ended up in the hole in solitary confinement. But eventually I was released. And at that time I was keeping my nose clean. I found new, new hobbies and new interests. And my brother called me one day, uh, my uh, half-brother, and he told me that this guy Eric Hines wants to speak with me, that he used to be a hacker and he has a lot of interesting things he'd like to talk to me about. And I kind of really wasn't that interested. And my brother called me again, saying, this guy really wants to talk to you. So I called the telephone number. It turned out to be this guy that wasn't Eric, but what he would do is he would actually page Eric to his number, and he'd conference it in, in like this ultra, you know, doo 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 So I finally get this guy on the phone, and he seemed very knowledgeable about phone freaking. He knew a lot about the internal systems at the phone company. He knew about equipment in the central offices, and it intrigued me because I had a passion for technology. So we set up a meeting to meet at a hamburger hamlet, and I brought a friend of mine along, a guy named Louis DePayne, who had incidentally was my uh, hacking partner for a number of years. And we, meet the, and we meet this guy, Eric, at a hamburger hamlet, and he starts telling us that he was part of the Kevin Polson case. Everybody familiar with Kevin Polson? Okay. And he starts telling about me about all their escapades into phone company offices. I'm sitting there and I'm listening. And I said, so what happened to you? Because Polson was busted. He says, well, I was in Texas and I was busted for some, doing some sort of credit card fraud, but they wanted some information about how I was doing the fraud, the FBI, so I cooperated with them and told them how I, how I was able to commit these frauds. This is him telling me. And uh, I got out early, I got a deal. I said, so they didn't ask you about Polson? He goes, no, they only wanted to know about me. Doesn't sound like the FBI, no, usually they want to know about everything. So eventually, during the conversation, he says, we're talking about different systems at the fun company, you know, Cosmos, uh, SCCS, I'm not going to go into uh, all the, Mizar, remember all these, familiar with all these names of internal systems at Ma Bell? And then he mentions a system called SAS. He goes, you know about SAS, don't you? And I go, uh, maybe, what, is, what does it do? He says, where you can monitor anybody in Pacific Bell. And I go, no, no, I go, tell me more about it. And then he clammed up and didn't say another word, and the meeting ended. And I was intrigued, I wanted to find out, I didn't know about this system called SAS, what exactly is it? And how he told me he discovered it is he and Kevin Polson were actually in one of the phone company central offices, found the equipment, and were able to hook up a tape recorder and actually record the protocol going back and forth. So what I did is I called the phone company, and uh, using my social engineering skills, I wanted to find out the company that developed this um, tool. And so after about you know, two or three phone calls, I found out the name of the company that manufactured SAS. I do some research on this company, and I find out 
that they went out of business. They no longer are in business. So I did a little bit more research and I found out the, the founders of the company tracked one of them at home, pretended to be a person working for Pacific Bell IT, and that I wanted to make improvements on the system, but I had no information. And the guy says, well, since we went out of business, do you want me to send you the design plans and the different protocols and everything? I could, uh, I could either FedEx it to you or I could fax it to you. What do you want? I said, sure, fax it to me. So then I had all the protocols and all the information of how to access SAS. And how SAS worked is they had remote uh, RTPs, remote test points in every central office, and they'd use computer terminals in the test department at Pacific Bell, and it would talk to a concentrator. That concentrator would dial up to the RTP in each central office, and it would use a proprietary protocol, and it would give the test technician the ability to make calls from that number, to listen to the calls, to do a number of different test functions. So now I had the capability, like Eric had, of using SAS. So let's fast forward. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a lengthy story, but it, it's kind of interesting. So I started to get suspicious about uh, Eric because every time we'd get together or talk on the phone, he'd start like asking me questions. Who do you associate with? Who do you talk to? What are, there, what are other hackers doing? And to me, that was a big red flag and yellow flag. So I started to wanting to look into, well, who is this guy? And at the time, the Public Utilities Commission did not tariff caller ID in California. But since I had switch access, I did. So I basically implemented caller ID in Los Angeles. I set up caller ID on a friend's telephone, and then at 3.30 in the morning, I called Eric's pager number to call his telephone number. He did, and we were able to ID the number and then from there get the address information from the phone company. It turned out this went to the Oakwood Apartments in Los Angeles, California. Then I decided, well, I gotta find a little bit more about, about Eric, I just know his name. I call the Oakwood, I find out from the phone company the unit number he's living in. I call up the rental office, pretending to be Oakwood Corporate, I was able to get the whole rental application for the apartment where that phone terminated it. And to my surprise, there was no work information on this application. It only listed a mobile cell phone number. So I did some research and I found out that this mobile telephone number is listed in the name of Mike Martinez. And then to find out more information about this number, I needed to either be the customer and use social engineering, or I needed to get into the cellular phone company's network. At the time, I found a vulnerability in AirTouch Cellular, so I was able to get inside access to their internal network. What they gave me the ability to do is look at any calls that were originated from that cell phone or terminated. And one number that kept popping up over and over and over again was 310-477-6565, which is the headquarters of the Los Angeles FBI. So there I knew that there was a big problem for me because this guy was either an undercover agent or he was an informant. So, why I'm telling you the story, too, is because I had to go through a lot of trouble to implement caller ID to get his telephone number. Now I'm going to show you how you can unmask private numbers, because if it happened today, you would have simply blocked his number. Um, after I got the cell phone number, I pulled all the cell bills, because I had access to all their internal systems. And then I started doing traffic analysis and found that this cell phone number was calling other phone numbers within government other FBI cell phone numbers, and at the end of the analysis, I had every telephone number that belonged to the White Collar Crime Squad in Los Angeles. So what I started doing was having their numbers. I was able to do originating and terminating number searches, and then what I started doing was searching on Eric's number. Well, who's calling him within AirTouch Cellular? And who's calling Pacific Bell Security? And then I was able to find the case agent's cell phone number because he was calling Eric, he was calling Pacific Bell Security, he was calling different numbers at the Bureau. So then, what I did is there was this device called the DDI. Are, is anybody familiar with it? The, a guy named Marky Sasalman Milwaukee. And what the DDI device allowed you to do was monitor the forward and reverse control channel of a, of a cell site and actually be able to see calls. Anybody remember the DDI device? Okay, maybe two or three hands. So at the time, I was working as a private investigator in Los Angeles, and I set up in my office a scanner that monitored the forward control channel of the cell site in Calabasas, California. 
So any time any of those agents, if they registered their phone, drove into the area or through the area, it would alert, it would kept the, the PC would capture the data and it would alert me with a page. So on September 28th, 1992, I walk into the office eight in the morning and I hear this weird thing beeping sound as I open the, the office door of the PI agency. Nobody else was there. And I'm like, listen, where's this beeping coming from? And I, it's coming from my office. Wait, it's coming from my PC. And I go to the PC and see that I caught one of the, the case agent's telephone number actually in my central office. I mean, in, uh, in the cell site, right? So I knew that the agent was within two miles of where I was because that was the cell site's coverage. So, what do I do? Well, I knew two things were happening. One, I was under surveillance. Or two, they were going to my address in Calabasas to get a description of the premises for a search warrant. I assumed the latter, a search warrant. So what did I do? I went to Winchell's Donuts and bought a big 24 pack of donuts. And I wrote on a sign on my refrigerator, you know, for FBI, and I cleaned out my apartment. <laughs> But I wasn't sure if it was really the Bureau, okay? Uh, no, I knew it was the Bureau. I wasn't sure if they were really gonna search me at the time. So I was really unprepared. I waited the next day. Nobody knocked on the door. There was nothing happening. So the next day I got kind of lax, but I still kept the donuts in the refrigerator. And I went to bed. Around five in the morning, I hear somebody putting a key in my door. Actually a key, I could hear the key go in. And it kind of woke me up. And somebody's like f messing with the door. Immediately, I didn't think government, I was thinking, oh, somebody's trying to break into my apartment. So immediately I jump out of bed, and at that time, I slept nude. <laughs> no, too much information. And I go, who is it? You know, FBI, open up, open up. And I was like dazzled, right? It was like 5.30 in the morning, and I open up the door, and I'm facing a female FBI agent right there. <laughs> and the nude. <laughs> A little bit embarrassing, but, but, uh, but oh well. So, in any case, once that happened, I knew that the government uh, uh, was definitely looking into my activities. So what I decided to do was use SAS, which I never really used before, and monitor the informant. So now that I had Eric's telephone numbers that were in his apartment because I got them through the phone company, I then used SAS to monitor those numbers for one day. And about after one hour, there's this call that comes in, and when the call comes in, you hear like it's, uh, what they call it is a sash shoe, as you call the frame, you put up a sash shoe, and then you use that, uh, use SAS to actually lay and wait for the call. The other way was using what they call a no test trunk, which you, had to, you could only use when the call's in progress. So the call came in, and I'm listening, I'm actually at the offices in this PI agency in Calabasas, and I hear uh, Eric answer the phone, and it, it's a guy named Ken. And all of a sudden, they're discussing Mitnick and discussing a search warrant and evidence. And I'm listening to this call with all the full attention. And what I found out later, this was uh, the case agent and the informant working together to try to collect evidence against me at the time. So, um, at that time, that's when I knew that I was in serious trouble, and uh, I needed to get out of town, so to speak. Unfortunately, my supervised release wasn't up for another month, meaning if I left, I'd be actually a fugitive for my probation. So what I did is myself and Louis DePayne, we conspired with an attorney, actually, to come up with a disinformation campaign, meaning Eric had no idea we knew he was an informant and working as a government agent, but in knowing this, and knowing that he doesn't know that we know, we could feed him information that would go to the Bureau. And the whole purpose of that disinformation campaign was to get them to delay issuing an arrest warrant or arresting until my probation ended because it ends by time. And what happened is we actually thought it had worked because nobody came after me until two or three days after my supervised release expired. So, 
why I'm telling you the story is to give you a little bit of history of my background of what actually happened with him. And now I'm going to give you just a, I'm just going to divert to a quick demo because I know we're running out of time of how this tool would have been very useful to me back in those days if I was still an unethical hacker of unmasking caller ID. So I'm going to show you on a, on a little video first and explain it, then we c I could demo it. So, one moment. There's this uh, provider, this uh, SIP trunking provider called Flowroute. I believe they're out of California. And I think because of a feature of their system, one second, it allows you to easily unmask caller ID. So I'll walk you through this video really quick. It's kind of slow, and I should have speeded it up, but I'm sorry. So I'm going to log into this Flowroute account I, I created. And what the first thing I'm going to do is just purchase a DID, and then I'll walk you through how this works. <coughs> so at least you get something useful other than stories, something that you could actually use for uh, your inbound calls. So I'm going to purchase a DID. I'm going to purchase an Idaho number. It's like a buck thirty-nine. I just went through every step so you'd see what's going on. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get it. It's going slow. I can't speed it up. I could stop it, of course. So I'm going to just go in and get the SIP configuration for asterisk so I can do the registration which is all common, this is all uh, no-brainer stuff, but I wanted to put it in for people that don't know, and I can make the video available. So this is so when a, when a call comes into the DID, it, it, knows, it, it knows where to send the call. So here's my asterisk VPS box. So I'm going to uh, modify sip.conf. I did this by video rather than doing it live because things always mess up. So this is all common really easy stuff and just setting up a DID. Then I'll get into how you, uh, uh, why this works. And why this actually works is this particular sub trunking provider is like enterprise class. So what happens is they're getting the ISUP information and you're able to map, map the SIP headers to the ISUP information so you're getting, the, uh, you're getting the caller ID information and you're getting the privacy bit. So a normal call, when a call comes in, here's a SIP header, you see the from number, this is my cellular phone number. Oops. Let me back it up. One moment. Okay. You're getting the from number, okay, which is the number that I'm calling from, and the p certed identity is basically a SIP header that contains the same information. Here the call is not blocked. This is a normal call coming in. So one second. We'll go to a block call. One moment. So if you, look at, if, you, if you look up here, you'll see here it's from anonymous because it's a block call. But since this particular provider is still getting the P-certed identity, it's still able to map to the ISEP information, you're, you're actually getting the caller ID in the P-certed identity header, and then you're getting the privacy ID. And this means that the privacy bit is set. So all we want to do is we're forgetting that information. What I do in this little eight-line asterisk script is basically look and see if anybody's calling me, is there a privacy ID set? If it is, it will, it will prepend 900 to it. It will set that as the caller ID and then call me so I'll see the number. So there's the privacy ID. There's the P-certed uh, identity. So we're going to check if the caller ID is private. If it isn't, we're just going to forward the call. If not, we're going to prepend the 900 to it. So I have to modify extensions.conf. And is everybody following this? Pretty, it's pretty straightforward and easy, actually, if you've played with asterisk before. So because there's an asterisk bug, I, uh, well, you'll see it in a moment. There's like a deadlock audio bug. There's like one in line in there that will hopefully go away when they, when they come out with a new release. Sorry, this is a little bit slow. This is because of the asterisk bug in the, new li in the first line. That takes care of that. Then what I'm doing is I'm just setting two variables. 
I'm setting the pserted ID to the uh, to the uh, pserted ID from the uh, f identity from the SIP header. And the same thing I'm going to do is set it for the caller ID as well. I mean the privacy bit. I'm sorry. You'll see it in a second. So I mean, you just have to copy these eight lines and sign up front of the account, and you can unmask your caller ID. Then I'll get into a couple more stories at the end. I just wanted to show you this real quick. So what I'm going to do is, if you see at line four, I'm going to go to uh, if 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 the if the privacy bit is set. I'm just going to jump further down. Otherwise, I'm going to just set the caller ID normally. I'll jump down to line eight. You'll see it in a second. I hope this is interesting to you folks. I, I, I like when people call me. I could see their number. You know, that's just me. Because my business card is out there, right? So everybody calls me at all times of day and night. So I like to see who's calling me. So basically all this is doing at lines five and uh, five is just basically setting the, the caller ID and then dialing out to me through flow route. This is where I jump to, to if, the, 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 if the privacy is bid is set, then I'm still gonna, gr I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna prepend 900 to the caller ID on the P asserted identity. Then I'm going to set, you know, set that and then call myself. So what happens is when somebody calls me and the number is blocked, it will prepend 900 to it. Has anybody done this before, or is this old stuff for you? Okay, yes. Okay. It's for some that don't. Because I rarely find providers that actually have the, the P-certed identity and the privacy bit that they'll provide you that information. I haven't found any, so this is why it's kind of unique to me and I just found it the other day. And that's basically it. So, does anyone want to give this a shot? You'll call me unblocked to my, uh, to my DID and then you'll call me blocked. Do you want to see the difference or do you believe it? Oh, right, you want to see it? Let's see it, all right. All right, so go to the camera. Ah. Somebody's sending me all these texts. All right, let's hold on a second. <laughs> See? All right. Don't send me text messages. Okay. So, anybody have a cell phone? They want to call me uh, blocked? All right, here's the number. Who's doing that? Okay. That's, that wasn't blocked because you don't see the 900. So, you want to call 208 906 8200. That's the. Uh, that's the DID that's uh, going through this uh, asterisk logic. 208-906-8200. I could also do it from this phone, but if you want to try it. There you go. Somebody called it. There, you see it? It's prepending the 900. And what that means is when I get a call, if I see that 900 and the number, I know that they intentionally tried to block the call to me. So this is kind of cool if you want to unblock caller ID. I wish I had this years ago. I'll show you. I'm kind of jumping around here. But I, I wonder, do you all want to see a quick video? I was working with a television company out here to do a pen testing reality show. And if you ever heard of Tiger Team, have you heard of Tiger Team? Yeah. I was on for two days. I mean, two episodes. I thought it was a great show. I'm really sad they canceled it. I actually know Luke and I know, I know, I know Pyro. And... Uh, I thought it was a good idea, but for, for some reason they canceled it at True TV. So another company has actually been shopping around the idea of me heading up one of these reality pen testing shows, and they just created a trailer. And I thought when they sent it to me, uh, they sent it to me about five or six months ago, I thought, oh, I wonder what they thought of it. You know, is it, is it going to be crappy? And I played it, and it was actually pretty good because they blended a lot of different scenes in from Italian Job, from Alias, and so on and so forth. So, so do you all want to see the quick uh, trailer? All right. All right. Hopefully, we, and if we can get sound here, because we're going to need sound. Oh, come on. So we have the sound set, I hope. 
and we're gonna try it. Once called the most feared computer criminal. It was captured in 1995. Definitely the most renowned hacker of our time. Hyperbole, I can't help it. Kevin was systematically hacking the computers of some of the world's large cellular telephone manufacturers. He was able to elude us by virtue of, of knowing the uh, telephone and the computer systems well enough. He was arrested and subsequently sentenced That's to federal prison picture, time. Isn't it? So they did this uh, little trailer. I thought it was kind of cute, so I thought I'd share it with you. Uh, I don't think it's going to go anywhere because I can't imagine Apple or Nintendo saying we could pen test you and have it on reality TV. I just don't see it. I don't see the benefit. They don't care about their product placement. And I, I wonder if my uh, high school teacher, if he saw this, uh, I, I, I never, I don't think I've told you the, uh, the story of this. When I was in the phone freaky in high school, and I, was, uh, I had another student, and he said, hey, you might want to go to computer class. It's kind of interesting. And at the time, I was like, oh, no, I'm just interested in telephones and radios. I can care less about computers. And at the time, uh, to get into computer class, you had to have like a, like a prerequisite of trigonometry and calculus and all this sort of thing. And the telcos were going for electromechanical switching, you know, crossbar over into ESS. So I kind of half wanted to get involved in computers, but I didn't have the prerequisites. So the student introduced me to this uh, computer instructor. He said, I'm sorry, Kevin, you know, uh, you have to wait till you uh, take these additional math courses, and we can't let you in. So my friend says, hey, show the teacher what you can do with the telephone. So I was able to do all these, like, neat things that I, uh, that this, that you can imagine what you could do with the telephone system, actually access computers over voice. And he says, sure, I'm, raising, I'm going to waive the prerequisites and let you into class. So the first assignment was to find the first 100 Fibonacci numbers in like uh, Darth Mouth Basic. And to me, that was boring. Who cares about finding the first 100 F F Fibonacci numbers? I was more interested in finding the teacher's password. And at the time, can you imagine, you had an Olivetti 110 baud terminal, and you dial up to the, uh, the DEC system, uh, which was running Rista C, you remember that, and you'd, you'd use the acoustic coupler, and you were doing a, you know, a lightning uh, a fast speed of 110 baud. So the teacher, when he was typing in his password, he would like really shield it, and I go, oh, what is he trying to hide? I want to get his password. So rather than writing that program that would find the first 100 Fibonacci numbers, I simply wrote a simple login simulator. So what it would do is it would simulate the Rista C system that he was dialing up to, 
it would take his username and usernames were, it was actually a number, one comma five or whatever, and ask you for the password and it actually would log him in. But he wouldn't know that he's actually, you know, talking to my code and not talking to the operating system. So then what we would do is we'd go up to him and say, hey, Mr. Christ, your new password is blah, blah, blah. And he'd get really pissed and he'd go change it. And he couldn't figure out how we were doing it. He actually made me, this is not, not bullshit, he actually made me, when he would log into the computer, I'd actually have to leave the classroom. <laughs> this guy thought I was David Copperfield, right? That I, you know, that I can get his password. I actually had to leave the room. He didn't know he was talking to my login simulator. So I got bored of that, right, getting his password. So I figured, I want to call up, dial up to USC because they had the newest games, you know, Star Trek, Zork, Adventure. Right? And my buddies, you know, we wanted to uh, dial up. They had a restricted Centrex, so you couldn't dial nine to get an outside line. Well, me with my phone, uh, phone ability and knowing how it worked, I simply used social engineering. I called a department called RC Mac in Pacific Bell and just added outside calling. And then what we would do is we would uh, call into USC and play games when we were supposed to be doing assignments. Unfortunately, an Avedi all of Betty printing terminal, the teacher was able to come back into class and look at the paper, you know, what, what is he doing? How's he getting into USC? And he's looking at it, and he rips off the paper. At, at a point, he was getting so angry with us, he would actually sign a part of the, the printout, you know, the, the, the spooling printout. And then when we'd, he, we couldn't take it with us, he'd actually look to make sure that the top was with his signature. So this got kind of tiring for him. So one day he shows up to class. He brings all the students into the classroom. He says, Students, I found the one device that's going to stop Kevin from dialing up to USC. <laughs> and I'm kind of looking cool. I, where do you get that device? And he holds up a telephone lock. It was a dial phone. And he proudly places the dial lock into the, into the telephone, uh, number one position. And he proudly takes the key, and he puts it in his pocket, and he has a big smile on his face. And of course, I said, Mr. Christ. What's the telephone number of the uh, administrative office? And he gives it to me, and then you know the pulsing trick. I just pulsed out the number. This guy, his face turned red. He actually took the phone. This phone it was like this type of phone with a dial and threw it across the room. <laughs> so I guess I didn't get along too well with my uh, computer instructor, instructors in those days. So let me tell you about the, you know, I kind of told you about my funny hack in the McDonald's. Uh, and then I know we're running out of time, so I just want to tell you what was the most scariest kind of hack for me. And this is when I was a fugitive in uh, Seattle. Um, I was leaving my apartment one day, and I, and I, I had a phone. I had the Novatel PTR825. I was able to get the source code to the cell phone. So what I did was I was able to modify the phone so when it would sit in idle mode, it would, it would, it would listen to the reverse control channel. And what would happen is if the signal met certain strength requirements, it would capture the MIN and the ESN of anybody that was in listening distance of the cell phone and put it into a table. Rather than me having to go get an ESN and an MIN, my phone device would actually listen to it and store it. Okay? So what I did is I went outside my apartment, and I turned on my cell phone, and I was having a conversation with somebody. I forgot who. And all of a sudden I hear, do 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 and there's a school here. There's like a school where I'm walking. And it was like a military helicopter. And you know, I'm just thinking, nah, you know, it has nothing to do with me. And all of a sudden, it, I thought it was going to land in the school, and it's like hovering over my head. Juju, 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 juju. And I go, no. You know, and I'm, I'm, I, I turn off the cell phone, and I run. And where I was in Seattle, in the U District, there's lots of covers and trees and yada, yada, yada. And I wasn't sure, did it, was it with me? Was I being paranoid? So I got like about three blocks into the U District, ducked, my, ducked into a store, and then I turned on my cell phone again to make a call, and all of a sudden, doo 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 and the helicopter was coming closer. I go, shit, now what's going on here? So I waited a little bit, and it was like right outside the store that I just ran into. I shut the cell phone off. Then I because of the situation of you could exit both sides of the store, I decided to go out the store and go about, I'd say about four or five or six blocks away at the uh, end of the U District in Seattle. I turned on the cell phone again and damn it, 
the helicopter's coming. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So I never found out what happened of who that was, or was it the cellular phone company, was it the government, or whom, was it a private investigation firm? I never found that out in my discovery who that was. But I remember I called my dad. As it kind of startled me having a helicopter chase you. So I remember I had a secret code with my dad that if I paged him with a, with a certain code, he'd go to a supermarket to a pay phone and he'd wait for my phone call for like 15 minutes. With my mom, it was a more intricate system. Because of the, all the, because I know if, the, if a government or a law enforcement agency knows you're going to a pay phone, it's really easy to get the history terminating originating numbers. I know it because I, I did it on them. So what I figured is uh, with my family, I'd contact them, is have them go into a casino. So I'd have, they'd have a pager and I'd page with a certain code means Stardust, Mirage, whatever, right? And then they'd go in and, and listen for the call to be paged like Mary Sue and they'd go to the white courtesy phone and pick up the call, and that would be me. And it'd be really difficult for the government to trace these calls. With my dad, it wasn't so, it was, uh, since I didn't talk to him so much, it was where I'd call him at a pay phone. So I remember calling him up, saying, Dad, Dad, you wouldn't believe what happened. He goes, what, what, what what's going on? And I go, a helicopter just chased me. He goes, son, you really need help if you think helicopters are chasing you. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, no, Dad, it was really chasing me. And he goes, he goes, you really need to see a psychologist. You, no helicopter's chasing you, Kevin. You're, you're, you're being paranoid. So anyway, um, long story short, it was, uh, I was being chased, but I never found out by who or who, what had happened. So what am I doing today? Um, it's, it's, I, I, I'm really fortunate. You know, I never thought I'd be where I am today, and a lot of it has to do with a lot of you that were my supporters. Um, I still give thanks to everybody that was part of the Free Kevin movement, you know, especially uh, Manuel and everybody part of the 2600 group. I really knew that there was no influence on the courts because you can't influence the government, but at least it got the message out there about, you know, about some certain civil rights violations in my case. I never said that I didn't deserve to be punished, but they went a little bit overboard by holding me in solitary confinement because I could launch nuclear whistle, missiles by whistling launch codes. So today what I do is I go around the world and I do a lot of public speaking engagements, not what I'm talking about now, but mostly like on social engineering and wireless security. I do a lot of penetration testing, so companies you know, hire me to hack in. Kind of what I was doing all my life, but I do it with authorization and I get paid for it. And I don't have to go to jail for it. So it's kind of a win-win-win situation all the way around. But I want to sincerely thank all of you for being there for me when I was, I, I was at the bottom of the bucket during that time in my life when I was sitting in federal prison not knowing if I'd ever get out. The government was saying they wanted to hold me for 400 years for making like 21 clone cell phone calls. And I never had a light at the end of the tunnel. And at the time, the government wanted me to become an informant, they actually wanted me to tell on what other people were doing. And I refused because I had the integrity not to become a snitch on somebody else just to get myself out of trouble. Yeah. You know. Because unfortunately that what's happens, that's what happens in 95% of the time is people cooperate against each other and uh, everybody goes down. And I just, you know, again, I didn't think that was part of my personal integrity, so I figured, hey, if I did something wrong, I'm going to take the licks for it and I'm not going to try to bring somebody else down with me. So when I was going through this whole process, I had hundreds of people writing me letters, taking my phone calls, building websites, starting the Free Kevin movement. Um, I mean, and today I'm still thankful for all of you that have participated and supported me all those years. I don't know who all of you are because, you know, I, when I was in prison, I, you know, didn't get much access to email. Why? Because when people would send me even printouts of email, they would actually prohibit me from looking at, from getting a copy of the email, saying it's in secret code. I go, what do you mean secret code? And they would look at the MIME headers and go, that is a code. <laughs> That's the intelligence of the Bureau of Prisons. But again, I want to thank everybody for being there for me. I'm kind of sad that this is the last hope because I kind of look forward to it. I, I couldn't make it last year, but I thought this would be a tradition that would continue. 
where people that share similar interests would get together. And again, I want to thank everybody for being part of uh, 2600 and HOPE, and I'm, I'm glad I could be part of it now. So thank you. Yeah. So I have a gift for most people here, and I don't know, I, I, they said they had like probably two minutes left, one minute? Two minutes. And I don't know how I'm going to get this to you because I have to be courtes uh, give courtesy to the next speaker, but I normally have these on my website, you know, and because I don't like going and doing the mail, I, I you know, charge five bucks, but I, I'm not charging anything because I'm here at this conference. All of you are my fan. I mean, I'm your fan, meaning I, I um, I, I'm in de dedicated to your support through the years of my uh, problems and stuff like that. So I wanted to give this gift of my lockpick business card, but I don't know how to give it out without interrupting the other speakers. So you can come up to me, and it's absolutely free of charge. I'd be happy to give you one of these cards. I only had brought, I ordered like uh, 600 of them because they're kind of expensive. They're like three bucks a piece. So any of you that want one of these lockpick business cards, you're welcome to come up and. Um, <laughs> I'll give it to you. Do I run out? Go. Whoa, slow down. <laughs> All right, we're going to do this on the mezzanine. Otherwise, we're going to have uh, like a Who concert situation here. There's going to be people smashed, and Robert Townsend will be looking at young boys. It'll be a bad scene. So if you head downstairs to uh, the second floor, Kevin will be handing out uh, lockpick sets that are also his business card. Coming up next in this room, we'll be building hackerspaces everywhere. Your excuses are invalid.